Hello chaps and chapesses, and this week we're going to talk about the mysteries of tides for flats fishermen. To be a successful flats fisherman, you have to have a basic understanding of tides. It is one of those topics of conversation that I have with numerous people who are looking to travel around the world and almost one of the first questions that I get asked, what are the tides like in that week? And the reason is the tides can have such an enormous influence on how the fishing is going to happen during the course of your fishing week. To be a really successful flats fisherman, you have to have a basic understanding of tides, how they work, and what influences them. The main reason for this is the insight that you gain from looking at tide charts and knowing the topography of the area you are going to fish is what allows you to divine where the fish could be at any given time and how you're going to intercept them. So to improve your chances of understanding where the fish are going to be, you have to have a basic knowledge of tides and what makes them tick. It's this influx of clean tide that quite often can refresh an entire flat system and starts the cycle of life and the cycle of feeding. As a fly fisherman and a flats fisherman, an understanding of this is vital. For example, you could find yourself on the flats, the water's going to be too hot and tepid and it's not going to hold any fish. Or you could find yourself in a situation where the tide is pushing in much harder than you anticipate and it can be dangerous. The way I like to explain this is think of the world as having a giant rubber band around the outside of it. And the rubber band are the world's oceans. The influencing factor on that rubber band is the moon and the sun. Two large voids in space which create a gravitational pull that will stretch that rubber band if you like. The moon has roughly twice the influence on the world's oceans as the sun does. Mostly because it's considerably closer despite its much smaller mass. So as the moon moves around the world, it pulls the water towards it and stretches the band. So as it does that, because you have to have equal and opposing forces, as it pulls the water towards it in one side, by the same notion, you will also get a bending on the other side of the world. This bulge that the moon creates is our high tide. So the next factor that you need to consider is when the moon and the sun line up, they are exerting a much larger gravitational pull than either one would do by itself. So therefore, it creates a larger pull on the world's ocean, which gives you your spring tides. But when you find that the moon is at right angles to the sun, it cancels out some of that strength and therefore it doesn't pull as much and therefore you get your neap tides. So what do I mean by spring and neap? These are expressions that we use when we're talking about tides all the time. So your spring tides are your much, much higher tides, and then your neap tides are your much, much lower tides. So as you go through your daily cycle of a tide, then you will find that the neap tides don't get as high, but the spring tides will get much, much higher. So when you want to target certain species or certain situations, then you have to take these factors into consideration because you will find that some species will fish better on a spring tide and some will fish better on a neap tide. So the moon takes 24 hours and 55 minutes to go round the earth. And the reason that our tides move by a 55 minute increment every day is because of this 55 minute difference. So that is why when you look at a tide chart, you will see that your highs and lows will progress along at a 55 minute interval per day. The moon's orbit around the earth is not perfectly round. So therefore, because of that slight variance, you will get a difference between your spring tides on a new moon and your spring tides on a full moon. And the tides are marginally bigger on the full moon. So from a fisherman's perspective, this tidal fluctuation, this bulge that moves around the world, creates the water to ebb and flow over the tidal shelves and onto the flats areas. Now there are some factors which will slow down these tides or speed them up. So the first obviously is the coastline. If you have a very, very intricate coastline, then you're gonna find that sometimes the tide takes so long to push through into the inner areas that actually you're only gonna get one high 
entire day, which is called diurnal. And then you have other influences such as wind or very strong currents. So a very strong onshore wind is going to make the drop of the tide prolonged, whereas if the wind is coming from the land and the tide is pushing in, it can hold it out for longer. But what tends to happen then is you will find that that tide will suddenly come in very, very quickly. And as a flats fisherman, these are things you need to be aware of, or you could find yourself in rather high water very quickly. So the first thing we tend to do is look at a tide chart. Now a tide chart is gonna give us our highs and lows during the day. It's gonna give us our approximate heights and from that it is our way of deducing where the fish are going to be at any given time. Now the first time you look at a tide chart, so especially a one which has been put over a time axis, then it looks a bit like an ECG. It's going beep, beep, beep. But actually the first time you look at it, you go, oh my god, that makes absolutely no sense. But all you've got to do is just actually look at the graph and if you figure out where your highs and where your lows and your timings are, it's actually quite a simple process. The tidal cycle I like to think of as a little bit, the flats are a bit like a leaf. And if you look at a leaf, you will see the main veins that run up through it and then all the little capillaries that run out through the leaf. So when you have, for example, an atoll and you have the water pushing in off the ocean, it'll come in through the deeper channels first and then it'll come up through the capillaries before it then rises over the entire flat. That means that you know that the fish are going to come in onto those deeper areas first so that you need to be there to intercept them. So essentially the main reason that a lot of these species come onto the flats is food and safety. So if you're a bonefish for example, the main reason that they come up into the really really skinny water is so that the predators can't reach them. So if you are going to fish bonefish then you want to be in the higher areas looking for a certain tidal height. Now if you know where you've got a big area and a big wide open plain of a certain depth and you know what stage of the tide that that is going to have the right amount of water on it, you can pretty much estimate where those fish are going to be. But after the bonefish or the other various other flat species, the, the bait fish come up onto the flats, then the predators have that opportunity when there is enough water to start sneaking up onto the flats to hunt their prey. So for example, giant trevally or tarpon or various other species which are kind of come in onto those deeper areas, they're going to be looking for bait, they're going to be looking for anything that is going to provide them with a meal. And on a spring tide, quite often that means they can get right up into a mangrove area or access areas that they wouldn't otherwise be able to hunt in. So all of these factors you need to take into consideration. So continuing that cycle and the analogy of the leaf, quite often when the tide's pushed all the way in, the fish species will be right at the back of the lagoon system. So you can hunt along the beach edges on the back of the lagoons for your bonefish or your tarpon or your permit or even GTs or any other species which you're hunting, whether you're in the Indian Ocean or whether you're in the Pacific or in the Caribbean. When you reach that apex of tide and the tide then turns, then the entire process happens in reverse. So then you come off those areas and you'll then be back onto the flats, maybe looking for rays pushing off, something like that, and you'll find that the rays will begin to drop off the flat as the tide drops. You'll see the bow waves of all your target species coming down off the apexes of the flats. And then you can find your intercept points so that you are down on the edges of the channels and then as the channels come down onto the edges of the reef. So that gives you your whole fluctuation of tide going all the way in, all the different fishing aspects that you can do, and then all the way out again in reverse. And there are certain destinations which fish better on a dropping tide. So don't always be absolutely fixated with having to fish the push all the time. Yeah, it's great, but quite often a dropping tide can be even more damaging, especially if those fish are feeling very happy and content, because you can clearly see them as they come off. When I first started fishing for Giant Trevally, for example, we thought that the spring tides were always going to be the best tides, because that means that the fish are going to come on fast and furious. But the thing I've really learned over the years is, for example, for Giant Trevally, if you're on a full spring tide, you will get a very busy period of time when those fish are piling onto the flats, but your window of opportunity while standing on those edges is very short. So therefore, what happens is you get pushed off the flats faster, you get pushed off the edges faster, and you end up having to hunt bigger fish back in the back of the lagoon or in the mangrove areas which is much, much harder to do. I like a neat to a spring tide these days because then I have a chance to fish most of the different stages of the tide. So at the beginning of the week, ideally, 
then you've got neeps which are going to build slowly through the week. That means you're going to get bigger and bigger tides as the week progresses and that can often be really beneficial on some of the atolls. But then you have some atolls or some areas that fish better on a dropping tide. And this really boils down to knowledge and experience. So if you're going to fish with a guide, they're the ones who've been on these areas for months and months, probably years, sometimes even decades. And in that time, they've built up this huge data bank in their head of exactly which areas will come prime at which times. Listen to them. Their knowledge is really what is going to help you to catch fish. And then you're beginning to think about all the different places that you can fish in the world. And I suppose really that's where I'm very lucky in the fact that I've had a chance to fish with some great guides in lots and lots of different areas of the world. So by looking at a tide chart, someone with that kind of experience has the ability to define which weeks potentially could be better for you because which species are going to be on what areas of which flats around the world. And that is where someone who has an extensive experience is going to be beneficial to you in making a decision as to where you should go and what species you should target. The other advice that I would definitely give you is that when you're fishing with guides, don't always target one particular species. I like to fish for what tends to come around the corner these days. If you set your heart on a particular species, quite often the tides are not right to attack that species or hunt them. In some ways, it's better to go for them at optimal tides rather than actually trying to squash a square peg into a round hole and then you're actually gonna end up ruining your fishing experience. So when I'm looking at a tide chart and I'm thinking about a particular destination in mind, what I'm really thinking about is which flats are going to be prime at which times and how much time you're going to have on those flats. And that's really where the tides are absolutely key. You can find yourself amongst a huge number of fish or you could suddenly find that you're wading across barren flats with nothing on them because maybe the water's been on there too long and it's too hot, fish won't come onto those particular flats. Whereas if you have that local knowledge, then you will be able to hunt those fish in other areas where they will be prevalent. Although you can normally find the high and the low tides quite easily in either a newspaper or the internet will give you the highs and lows, I use a tidal calculation package, which actually will generate a graph for me, which I can then read. And that gives me a really good idea of exactly what's going to happen in the weeks that I'm looking at. Even though a tide chart is there, you should always only ever use it as a guidance. At the end of the day, it's the ocean and it's going to be affected by a huge number of different factors. That can include weather, it can include wind, it can include huge currents or tropical systems which you will find in those areas. Those can all affect the tides and put them out, so don't ever treat a tide chart as gospel. Knowing you're going to be fishing a big spring tide, it's always a good idea to have the boat not too far away. I mean, there are some places, for example, which can have an eight-foot tidal push, and if you get caught in that, there are some bigger things coming in off that tide than just the fish you're targeting. So it's really important to stay safe as well. Otherwise, you can find yourself in very deep water very, very quickly. And it's not a nice place to be. As always, I hope you found that little interpretation of tides and flats useful. And if you did, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And I'll look forward to seeing you on the next one.